Amen. It's fun to celebrate together. It is good to be together today. Um, we want to welcome those who are with us online, those who are here in the room. Um, if this is your first time, my name is Jared. I'm the teaching pastor here. We want to welcome you to the Bridgepoint family. Uh, today is the last week of a very short three-part series called Kindled. Um, it comes after we studied the book of Acts through the summer. We saw that wherever the Spirit lit the flame, wherever the good news of Jesus went and was received in faith, the Spirit worked to pull together people who believed in Jesus so that they would live close to keep their fire burning. We've been using this image of a campfire that if the sticks and the logs of a fire are scattered, the flame flickers out pretty quickly. But when they're pulled together, their, their closeness fuels the fire and it keeps it burning. And that's, that's how we want to live. That's how God intends for the church to live in community with each other so that our faith can keep burning, so that our fire would be, be strong. And so the hope is that through this series, we would draw closer together in community and relationship within the church. We said that because God, who lives in relationship within the Trinity, made us in his image, we are created to live and thrive in relationships. Now, there is something that can mess that all up. Like sin lives in us and sin works among us. And so sin is, is the problem in all of our relationships. But fortunately, to God be the glory, that's not the end of the story. Jesus came to remove our sin so that when we believe in him and receive his spirit, we, we have a greater power than sin at work in us. And the Holy Spirit can restore our relationships, can draw us back together so that there's a unique potential, a unique capacity for relationships within the church. We always want to be a church that builds relationships with people who are not yet here, that serves our community, that loves people, no strings attached. But there is something special about the relationships shared among people who are committed to Jesus together. And so we have been walking through this series with the hope that eventually this would lead to action. We always grow closer to God, not just through knowledge, but through knowledge put into practice. And so the hope today in this final week of the series is that you would take a step that you would find a place in community within the church, you'd build new relationships and be encouraged and strengthened by it, that we would come close together to keep our fire burning. And so today we are going to be in Ephesians chapter four. I'll show you the page number up on the screen. I'd love for you to grab a Bible from one of the chairs around you if you wanna open up to it, uh, or maybe in your Bible app, Ephesians chapter four, one through 16. And as you turn there, what we're going to do today, we're gonna walk through this text pretty quickly going to identify three truths that it reveals about how God wants us to think about church, okay? So this might reframe how you think about church. And then we're going to step back from that to say, how do we put this into practice? How do we, many years after it was written, live out what Jesus wants for his church in close relationship with each other? But before we get there, as we do every week, I want to give you just a few moments right where you're at. We're going to sit in silence for a moment so you can use this time to prepare your heart and your mind and just invite God through his spirit to speak to you. So let's do that together right now. Spirit of God, I pray that you move in this moment, that you illuminate your scripture, that you impart your truth to our lives. Do your good work to help us to be the church you want us to be. May may we not let anything get in the way of that. I pray this all in the name of Jesus, our King. Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. We always want to understand the context so that we can take the truth and put it into our lives. The Ephesians was not written to us. It was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. It was written by Paul, the the great missionary apostle from the book of Acts. It was written by him for the church in Ephesus. Now, this church in Ephesus, he actually helped start. He spent about three years in, in the city of Ephesus, preaching the gospel, pulling people together, praying over them, developing leaders. And then he departed But after he left, he wrote them a letter that we now have in our New Testament. He wrote them a letter to call them to keep being the people Jesus wants them to be. So this book is incredible. It's written with with incredible precision. The first half, our chapters 1, 2, and 3, are this beautiful picture of the good news of Jesus. 
It is who Jesus is, what God has done for us, what it means for us, that he has adopted us as sons and daughters back into the family of God. He's renewed us. He's restored us. It's this beautiful picture of the gospel. And then in chapter 4, his writing takes a turn. So instead of focusing on what Jesus has done for us, he now focuses on how we live for Jesus. And the second half of Ephesians has instructions related to how we root out sin in our lives, how how we live as faithful husbands and wives, how parents and children relate to each other, how we carry out our work in a way that honors God, how we engage in a spiritual battle from the Spirit's power, not ours. It's an incredible manifesto about how to live for Jesus. But before he gets to any of that, the first place he applies the truth of the gospel is within the family of God, within the church. Ephesians 4 begins with this call to be the kind of church Jesus wants us to be. It's as if Paul is saying, before we get to any of that, you need to understand this because you can't be any of that. You can't do any of that if you're doing it all by yourself. If you're doing it out of your own power, in isolation, trying to keep your fire burning, it's not going to work. So first, let's talk about life in the kingdom. Life is the church, the body of Christ. And that's where we're going to go. So Acts, uh, sorry, Acts, Um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. This is where we're going to start. Paul writes, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So he looks back on what Jesus has done for us. He goes, God has done so much good for you. He's worthy of it all. He goes, make sure your life matches what he deserves. Did you catch that? Make sure your life, the way you live, the way you go about your days, matches what Jesus deserves. He goes, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. He's giving instructions to Christians within the church. He's saying, treat each other this way. Be humble, be gentle. When people mess things up, be patient. Bear with each other through hard things. Don't give up. Don't be quick to tap out. Endure with each other. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In other other words, protect the unity that we share with one another. Here's why. He goes on to say this. He says, for there is one body and one Spirit. There's a play on words here. So throughout the New Testament, the church, each local expression, is referred to often as a body. So he's saying, so, so there's one body, there's one entity, the church. And he says there's one spirit. We know he's talking about the spirit of God. But in Greek, the word for spirit is also the word for wind or air or, get this, breath. And so he's saying there's one body, the church, and there is one breath that animates your life. There's one breath that brings you to life. And that breath is the spirit of God within you and among you. And do you need any more reason to understand your unity? There's one body of the church. There's one breath, the Holy Spirit. He keeps going, though. He goes, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, there's one Lord, that's Jesus our King. There's one faith. There's one baptism, one common expression of our devotion to Jesus. There's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. His point is this. Everything we share in Jesus becomes the basis for our unity. So we share everything that is most important to us with those who belong to Jesus. There is a special bond here. Again, it's not exclusive. Anyone is invited into it, and we still love all all, all who, who surround us in the world, but there is a unique bond with those who believe in Jesus as their king, who live for him as such, who long for the hope that we have in him for all eternity who live by the power of the Spirit, who hold on to him and don't let go. There's a special bond between us. And that should change how we think about each other. And so as as, as we look into Ephesians 4, the first statement I want to make that should influence how we think about church is this. We need to see church as a body, not a bunch of parts. 
We need to see church. And when I say church, you know, you know this by now. I'm not talking about an hour every Sunday. I'm not talking about a building. I mean the people. We need to see church as a body, not a bunch of parts. Now, this stands in contrast to the way that we think about most of our lives. We live in such an individualistic society, don't we? That everyone just zeroes in on their life and their problems and their issues and their passions. It's all about me in this moment. But Scripture deconstructs this. This is not the way to think about faith. Okay, so, so often, we think that faith is just mine. It's private, it's personal, no one gets to touch it. We think about responsibility as being individualized. Like, my faith is my issue, your faith is your issue, we're just going to work it out on our own. Sometimes we even treat Sunday gatherings like this. We're gathering with the family of God, but we fly in and we fly out and we reflect on church through the lens of how it impacts me and my life, not us in our lives. And scripture says, no, 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 church is not a bunch of parts, not a bunch of disconnected people who have nothing to do with each other and no concern for one another. Church is a body. It is one. We are church. And this must shape how we interact with each other. It must shape what we care about within the the church. It must impact how we live and how we go about our days. That we are not just a bunch of parts that happen to show up in the same place once a week, and then we go home and try to live it out on our own. We are a body. We are one. I want to take it a step further. Ephesians chapter 4 continues by describing how Jesus has gifted to the church everything it needs to be provided for. So if you skip down to verse 11, we'll pick up. It says, So Christ himself gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Here's what it's saying. Jesus has apportioned different abilities and gifts to everyone in the church so that the whole thing can be built up. Here's here's what he's saying. To some, Jesus gave the gift of leadership and influence. Pastors and teachers. Evangelists and prophets. They all have unique roles, but, but this idea of Christian leadership is not that a few will do all the work, but that a few will equip everyone to contribute. It says that to everyone, he's given the responsibility of what's called here works of service, using your time, using your talent, using your energy, and, and, and everything you have to offer to contribute to the body so that it can happen in different ways. Maybe you have a unique skill. Maybe you are a singer and you can lead us to worship God. Maybe you have a talent with technology that can contribute in some way. Maybe you're great with kids or students. But the idea here is not, okay, it may sound like I'm making a pitch to join a team. If that's how the Holy Spirit's working, I don't want to get in the way. All right, we need it. But that's not what I'm talking about today, okay? I'm trying to change the way we think about church. Okay? And so often we think about the church serving us, about the church meeting our needs, and that is nothing like the picture that Ephesians 4 gives us. Here's the second statement I want to draw from this. The point is that every part of the body should strengthen the church, should strengthen the body. So you are a part of it. If you belong to Jesus, you've surrendered your life to him in baptism, you become a, an active part of this local church body, then you are a part of And your function, your role within the church is not to make sure you are okay or you are strong or you are growing. Your function within the body is to strengthen the whole body. Are you with me? The reason the hand exists is not for the benefit of the hand. The reason the eyes, ears, mouth, and nose exist is not for their individual benefit. It is to serve the body at large, to make the whole thing healthy. And so if we are going to gain Jesus' perspective on church, we first must understand that we are a body, not a bunch of parts, and every part of the body is intended to strengthen the body. That's our role. You have something unique to contribute. And so it may be you serving in some way on a team or, or in a ministry Or it may mean you open your home for hospitality. It may mean that you do what you can to meet the needs of those who need it. But the point is, we all have the perspective that I am here, a part of this, not just for my own benefit. I am a part of something bigger than myself. You are a part of something bigger than yourself. You're part of the body of Christ, the church. And you have a part 
in serving and strengthening it. So if we keep walking through this, you start to understand what the end goal is here. I want to read verses 11 and 12 again. It says, So Christ himself gave the apostles and the prophets, and the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Listen to this. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That's the goal, that we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of of Christ. So maturity is a word that is often used and rarely defined within the church. We want to be mature. We got to be mature or grow deep. But here it is an actual word with a finite definition. This word mature is a physical term that re- refers to someone who is grown, who is an adult. In contrast to an infant or a toddler or even an adolescent that is still maturing, uh, moving toward maturity, still, still developing, still strengthening, this word mature refers to a human body in its full and complete state. And it holds this maturity out as the goal for the church. To say the goal for the church is to be fully grown, grown up, complete. That the church would have what is called here the fullness of Christ, meaning we have received from Jesus everything he has to offer. We, we find grace and mercy for our sin. We find strength against temptation. We, we make progress in our relationships. We find joy and happiness and contentment. No matter what life brings, all the riches of Christ have been poured out and we have received it all. But notice how quickly you start thinking about that for you. Do you see that? You're like, yeah, I want that. I want to be strong against temptation. I want to be strong in my faith. I want to be, have a healthy marriage. I want to be pure and purposeful in my singleness. I want to be a good parent, a good friend. I want to do this or do that. And and all of a sudden, as I describe maturity, you start to think of you. I start to think of me. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about maturity, not about one part of the body, but about the whole body. I don't know if you've seen this. This movie came out a while ago. It's by M. Night Shyamalan. It's one of his lesser known titles. It's called Lady in the Water. A weird movie. I'm not recommending it. The only thing I remember is that it had this one character who always just worked out one part of his body. He did did bicep curls on one side. So his rest of his body looks kind of average or maybe even below, but his right arm was just jacked. And You'd look at that and you would not say that's the picture of health. Like, that's fit. I want to be that. You wouldn't say that. You do not judge your health based on one part of the body. Nobody comes up to you and is like, hey, how are you doing today? And you're like, man, I'm great. My right arm is doing so well today. My left knee is fantastic. Uh, Let me tell you about my my small intestine. It is just like, it is killing it today. And like, to God be the glory. You don't do that. You don't judge your health based on the strength or vitality of one part of your body, do you? You never do that. In fact, the inverse happens, where your whole entire body, except for one part, can be doing well. And what's the part that you notice? What's the part that you focus on? You judge your health whether or not everything is doing well. So take, for instance, your middle toe. How often do you think about your middle toe? Like never, right? Unless as you're walking this morning to get coffee, you stub it on a kitchen chair, and then you think about that middle toe endlessly, right? And if someone says, how's your morning going? Terrible. My middle toe hurts, right? And all of a sudden you're saying, I'm not doing well. My body's not doing well. Why? Because your measly little middle toe, right? You see what I'm saying? And so the goal is not to have one part or a few parts of your body that are healthy, but for your whole body to be mature and complete and healthy and strong. That's the picture we get of the church here. We're a body, not a bunch of parts. And every part is to serve and strengthen the whole. And Ephesians chapter 4 says that our shared goal is that we all, we all reach maturity in Christ. 
Let me keep reading. This won't be on the screen. I just want you to listen to this part. This is verses 15 and 16. It says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, that's all of us, not you, not your household or your family, all of us, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The only time maturity is mentioned is not in regard to any single part, but in regard to the whole body. And so our goal as a church should be to share responsibility that the people sitting next to you, the person in the row in front of you, the people with us online, that our goal, our success is not that some of us make it to the finish, that some of us grow up to have an impressive faith. That's not success. The vision Jesus has for his church is that the whole body, every part, grows up into the fullness of what Jesus has to offer. Amen? That's who we are. That's what we're for. And so it's all about us growing up as disciples of Jesus so that he gets more and more control over our lives, more and more influence among us, more and more of our devotion and love and obedience and respect and delight and worship because he deserves it all. That we would keep growing up toward that. That we would become his disciples, mature and fully complete. Not some, but all of us. And so the question is, well then, let's make this practical. How do we move toward that? How do we reorient our lives so that's our goal? That we and all around us who are part of this body with us are growing toward Jesus together. How do we do that? Well, we look at the life of Jesus. I believe that his life provides us with a template to say this is how we can prioritize this. Because Jesus' life, beginning to end, was all about making disciples, right? One of the first things he did when he set out in his ministry was he called a few fishermen to come and follow him. And after they dropped their nets and devoted their lives to him, he started to call more people to him. Everything, start to finish, was all about drawing people to himself and making them into disciples, all the way up till his final breath on earth here, after his resurrection, before he goes up into heaven, those same disciples were surrounding him, and he said, all authority has been given to me. Now you go, and you make disciples. That's the goal. And so what Jesus prioritized, he then passed on to those who were devoted to him. And you see the book of Acts, they just keep going all the way up until present day when we share the same command and the same call to be and to make disciples of Jesus. And so let's look at his life. Let's see how he ordered it. Let's see what kind of rhythms he implemented so that we might live like he does to be his disciples and to make more disciples. So, I'm going to use an image here. It'll be an image of four concentric circles that represent the rhythm or the pattern of Jesus' life. So I just want to walk through this, and then we're going to layer our lives over it to see how we can make ours look like his, okay? And so on the outside, the biggest circle is that Jesus spent time with the crowd. Maybe these are the stories you're most familiar with. I mean, that's, how, that's what happens when you're a miracle worker. You start raising people from the dead. You start healing sick people. You start walking on water and telling storms to behave. And all of a sudden, people want to see what you're about, right? They come out of the woodwork. And so in a very short time, people started surrounding Jesus. There would be houses filled with 50 or 100 people. There, there, there would be fields or mountainsides with literally thousands of people just trying to catch a word that he said or to see this person named Jesus. And Jesus didn't push him away. He didn't act like that's not what he wanted. Instead, he said, come on. And he used those opportunities with the crowd, primarily to do one thing. He used those times with the crowd to teach about the kingdom of God. He would use parables, using familiar images like seeds and soil or rocks and trees, birds, banquets and weddings, kings and servants. He he would use familiar images to teach them about the nature of his kingdom. He would call them and command them to obey him so that they could begin to experience his kingdom in their life. He would use the opportunities with the crowd to teach and to call, to cast vision about his kingdom. But that's not all Jesus did. You can move in a circle and you see that he also spent time with the disciples. 
So he was with the crowd sometimes, but other times he was just with his disciples. We know of 12 named disciples that Jesus called to them. But if you've seen The Chosen, if you've watched that Jesus series, you know there were some other people on the fringe. There were some women who came along, some other people. And so we're probably talking about a group of maybe 15 to 20 people who just shared so much of life with Jesus. They were with him on the road. They had slumber parties. They hung out in the fields. I don't know exactly what they did. They shared a lot of life. They ate meals together. There, there were times where Jesus would leave the crowd with them and they would debrief the day. The disciples would ask questions. Jesus, when you told that parable, what would that mean? And be like, still, you don't get it. And they need to explain it to them and they'd process it. And I get the feeling like this group of people, Jesus and the disciples, were sincerely friends, that they loved each other, that the disciples delighted in the friendship they shared. And Jesus needed it too. If you look at the Garden of Gethsemane the night before Jesus went to the cross, you can't tell me that the friendships were only for the disciples. Jesus needed them too. He depended on them. He longed for them to be there when he needed them most. And so you had this mutually beneficial friendship, this circle of community that Jesus shared. They delighted in each other, spent time together. They were close and connected. You, You can go in another layer. And you see that there were times in Jesus' life, we're going to give this circle specific names, Jesus spent time with three men named Peter, James, and John. They were a part of the 12 disciples, but for some reason, we don't know why, Jesus gave them special access to him. So for instance, there's one moment where Jesus goes up on this mountainside and he says, Peter, James, and John, come on, this is going to be cool. And they go up on the mountain. And in that moment, Jesus, it's called, he was transfigured. His appearance changed. And Peter, James, and John are just like, dude, what's going on? This is amazing. And Peter says something kind of silly, and Jesus rebukes him, but it's all cool. And there are other times that that these three were invited to have this private viewing of a miracle. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus goes in to to this house where this girl has died. And he's like, Peter, James, John, come on. This is going to be great. And, And he speaks to this girl, and she wakes up from death. And they have a front row seat to see it. So for some reason, Jesus chooses these three to invite closer, to develop them, to invest in them, to give them special access to him. And it should come as no surprise that these three are are among some of the most influential church leaders in the first generation. That Peter and John, when the book of Acts kicks off, Peter and John are right at the center of it. Peter is preaching the first gospel message. Peter and John are healing people in the name of Jesus. They each respectively become church leaders in different parts of the ancient world. They both write letters that become a part of our New Testament that we hold as scripture now. So there's got to be a correlation between the time they spent with Jesus, special access they had, and their development as kingdom leaders. And then you get to the inner circle, the smallest one at the core, and even Jesus spent time alone. Even Jesus, who had a perfect relationship with God the Father, constant access, unhindered by sin, to the Holy Spirit, even Jesus still had to retreat and had to rest and had to be still and quiet. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 is an example of this. It says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. In these moments of silence, In these moments of solitude, he prayed, very likely recited scripture. He was replenished by God, the Father, so that he could keep doing the work of God, the Father, so that he could carry out his purpose and live with focus and find the inner strength to keep going, even though though the crowds were demanding and the disciples were dull at times and the road was long and hard, Jesus would stop and he would be with the Father, and he would come back ready to go. And if you look at this, these layers of Jesus' life, don't you feel like something very significant about his ministry would be missing if any one of these didn't happen? If he wasn't with the crowd, if he didn't develop the disciples, if he didn't invest in the three, if he didn't spend time alone, something significant would be lacking in his life and in the discipleship that he brought to those around him. And so I'd like to use this as a way for us to think about our lives and our rhythms. I know life is busy. You know, all kinds of stuff going on, work and soccer practice and all kinds of grocery shopping and taking care of family, all of this, I get it. But what if we were able to layer our lives with the rhythms of Jesus and say, I care enough 
about being a disciple, and I care enough about helping the church, the body of Christ, to grow as disciples, that I'm going to adjust my rhythms to look like Jesus. So here's what it would look like. The outer layer, like Jesus, is spent with a lot of people. We call these large gatherings. So like last week, we go to Bristol Town Beach, and we have a picnic and baptism. Sometimes we do nights of worship, but primarily, this is talking about what we're doing right now. For some churches, it's gatherings of thousands. For us, it's gatherings of hundreds. It's a larger gathering, right? And we come together for very similar purposes what Jesus used these for. We open the word of God. We allow it to speak into our lives and to shape us into who God wants us to be. But it's more than that. In the same way that Jesus used these gatherings to cast vision for his kingdom, we come together to say, hey, can you imagine what we could do in this area around us if we just all are committed to the same thing? If we want to bring the kingdom of Jesus to our world through loving those around us, being hospitable and kind, being good employees, faithful community members, being being a positive influence around us, we cast vision here so that we go out from here all living with the same purpose. And we also gather for the ancient practice of sharing worship of our God. Jesus did this. It's not talked about much, but we know that he was raised as a Jew, which meant that he went to synagogue every Saturday for Sabbath worship. And so he lifted his voice with his community. And we see the same thing happening with the early Christians. They would gather on the first day of the week in honor of the resurrection. And they would lift their voices to worship Jesus, their king. So this large gathering that we do every single week is absolutely critical to us being disciples and growing as disciples together. There's another layer. I actually want to skip. I want to go to the the inner circle for just a moment. Because again, like Jesus... We need time alone. We talk about this quite a bit, that that your relationship with God is dependent on you spending time in Scripture and prayer. Jesus wants this for you. And we try to support you by giving you resources. As we begin to walk through the Gospel of Mark next week, we're going to provide you with all kinds of resources, reading and Scripture and memory verses, so that you can go into your closet, go into your quiet space, and you can spend time being replenished by God. This is absolutely essential to our growth, not only as individual parts, but as a body, the church. But I really want to give attention to these other two layers, because while I think Bridgepoint historically, and even now on this side of COVID, has done well with our large gatherings and our time alone, I think there is a ton of room for growth in these other two layers. And this is where we want to focus. This is where we want to challenge you to take action, to move toward the rhythms of Jesus. And so the the first layer we're going to talk about is what we call small groups. Okay? So you'll see inside large gatherings, we have small groups. And these serve a unique purpose. Okay? Within the church, just like Jesus and the disciples experienced, you should have friends. You should have people who know when you're having a hard day. You should have friends who know when you're going in for surgery or when your kids go back to school for the first day. And they pray for you and they're with you and they check in on you. You should have people who grieve with you and celebrate with you and pray. And whenever you are in need, they step up and step out to do whatever they can. You should have people who are close enough that you just sit down for meals and laugh and tell stories. You text each other throughout the week, seeing how they're doing. That your kids are known by them or their kids are known by you so that they see this intergenerational family of God coming together. This is what church is supposed to be. We care for each other. We bear each other's burdens. We encourage one another all the more. But here's the thing. That happens better in small groups than it does in large gatherings. It's really hard to connect with people on a deep level when we're gathered in groups of hundreds, right? Uh, Maybe you have an initial conversation. Maybe there's a really meaningful connection made. But you can't share life together in this format, right? And that does not mean that large gatherings are broken or bad. It means that they serve unique and equally important purposes in our discipleship. And so maybe for you, if you've been frustrated with the church, you're like, man, I haven't made any friends People don't know my name. Nobody calls me or texts me. It may be because you're looking to large gatherings to do for you what is intended for small groups. And you need to take a step of faith to say, hey, I want to open my life to that. I want meaningful friendship. I want community in the church. See, I I believe both are important. And that's why the church, in the book of Acts, we're committed to both. Acts chapter 2, verse 46, it says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. 
They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They gathered to worship God, to receive his word. And then they went home and practiced hospitality with smaller groups and shared life together. This is the rhythm that I believe is for our good. And so this is where it gets practical. This whole series is building toward you taking a step. And the step is for you to move toward closer relationships to keep your fire burning. So for some of you, you've already been in a small group. Maybe even your small group endured through COVID. Praise God for that. That's great news. So you just keep going. For some of you, you've been in a small group for years, and it's time for you to create that opportunity for other people, for your group to multiply and create more space. Maybe for you, you've never been in a group, but you really want one in your area, and you step up and say, hey, can I help it come here? And we work with you to do that. For some of you, you're willing to host, but you aren't able to lead, or you're able to lead, but you don't have space to host. And you're going to say, hey, I am willing to do my part to make this happen because I want to grow and I want to be a part of the body that keeps moving toward Jesus. I don't know what the step is for you, but the hope is that you would figure it out, that you would express a willingness to us. That after service, you would walk through the doors, you'd stop by our groups table, or you would get online and you would fill out the groups form so that we can support you in this. You don't have to figure it out on your own, but you've got to be committed to it. That's the one thing that we cannot do for you. And, and there's tons of flexibility right now. The old model of having one size fits all, that is, like, that is out the door. So some groups are meeting every week on a recurring basis for an hour, hour and a half for primarily discussion. Other groups are meeting every other week to share a meal together and spend extra time together. Some are meeting online there are men's and women's groups. If that's what works best for you, like the point is you've got to let us know and we will work with you to figure out what works. But expressing commitment, taking that step is something only you can do. And the hope is that you would want it for yourself as much as we want it for you. Listen, this is not self-serving. Like for us, like it's more work to have more groups, quite honestly. It doesn't make our lives easier but it makes the body better. That's why we want it for you. Because I absolutely believe the rhythms of Jesus draw us toward the kind of discipleship he wants to characterize, not just a few parts of the body, but the body as a whole. There is one last layer that I want to mention briefly. If you look back to the, um, the diagram, the, the final layer to fill in is what we are going to in the future call discipleship groups. Um, these groups are, uh, they, they will resemble what the kind of relationship Jesus had with Peter, James, and John, where a group of maybe three to five people choose to meet regularly, make time for scripture, accountability, and prayer. And through this, the focus is on disciple making and kingdom leadership, where the people who are a part of this would grow up to be kingdom influencers and disciple makers for the glory of God. Now, we, we don't have this all figured out yet. Our hope is that we're, we're doing a lot of groundwork on it right now. We're trying to lay the foundation so that we could launch something like this at the beginning of next year. And so if this excites you, let us know so that we can start to populate a list of people who are interested in doing this. But the point is that when all of this works together, I believe the body will be moving toward maturity, which is exactly what Jesus wants for us. We are not a bunch of parts. We are one body because we love Jesus together. And if you are a part of that body, Jesus intends for you to strengthen and serve that body with your time, with your ability, with the way that you care for the other parts. And our shared goal is that we all reach unity and maturity in Jesus. I think we can do this by moving toward the rhythm Jesus has for our lives. And so I'm asking you to figure out what that means for you and not go home and just think about it, but at some point this week, take a step to say, yes, I will do that. So before we end, uh, throughout this series, we've been telling the story of one of our small groups that, that has cared for each other well, that has influenced each other well. And so we have one final chapter of their story to share with you. Check out this video. Here. Just be as natural as possible.
if I miss it, I, I feel like I'm missing out, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, what are they talking about? What's going on? Like, you just want to, you know, that community, and you feel like you're missing that community when you're not able to come. I feel more rooted, like, physically and spiritually. Like, I wasn't planning on staying in this area, but, like, God has used this group to say, this is where you are. This is where you're going to live for now. And it's because of these people. Like, he used all of these people to say, these are your roots and like grow from here. And so it's just been a huge, it's been a huge impact on my life. In addition to that, to the times that we spend outside of our group meetings, the times we've gone camping or out to dinner, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, our families have, we've got to know each other's children and and um, really, and, it, and it's been a positive thing for my boys, to our three teenage boys who don't have a father that have men in this group that they can look up to. Yeah, that's one of my biggest things too, is being a single mom with um, a little girl and also being raised by a single mom as a little girl. I know the importance of having good godly men that are influences and I've been praying since my daughter, before my daughter was born, that God would bring good men in her life that can influence her and also, um, like even their kids, the boys will be good influences on her, her growing up because she's, excuse me, <laughs> because she's building that bond with all of these kids and all of the men and women in my group. So um, it doesn't only impact me, but it impacts my daughter as well. Going throughout the week, sometimes you tend to go a little off. And uh, you know, when this group is really great to uh, lean you to the other side, this group helps us carry out what we're learning in service every week, what we're learning from the Word, into everyday life. And I also know that when I say something in group, that these guys in a loving way are going to hold me accountable. I think for me, it's definitely made me a stronger Christian. I think that um, it's helped me learn the way that other people approach their faith and some of the strategies they might use for like, you know, how to read through the Bible, how to discern a passage, um, these are the same information or the same book. It's been really interesting too because it's just so much broader. Join and join fast. <laughs> yeah, don't hesitate. <laughs> I would say just just do it, you won't regret it. Mm -hmm. The benefits far outweigh any obstacles. Mm -hmm. And it's life changing, really. I mean, it will allow you to grow in your relationship with God while growing with other people. But it can definitely change your life, and God will work through it. Those relationships with you pouring your energy and effort into it, those, the Holy Spirit opens you up. But you have to be willing to commit to give it a try. Relationships grow and realize that the people that are in this group are not just your small group or your friends, but they become your family. Right. So. Amen. That's what we hope you experience. We hope you take a step. Um, as we reach the end of our service, I want to invite you to stand up. Um, and I would uh, end us with prayer. I love being together, church. I'm thankful for you. Uh, my hope is that through this series, you have felt drawn to the people who are part of the same body as you. We have the same breath, the spirit at work in us. And, uh, and we keep surrendering to him that he would make us into the full body of Jesus, our King. Let's pray. Father God, we love you and we thank you for this moment. Thank you for the, the way that you build us up, that you breathe fresh air into our lungs. Spirit, we need you. We are not enough on our own, so we just cling to you and ask you to keep doing the good work that you're doing among us. God, I pray for our church. I pray that we would be people characterized by close relationships, that we would not allow busyness or stress or fatigue or fear or bad experiences in the past keep us from taking the step of faith to, to have a life that resembles yours, Jesus. So please work among us and please do your good work to bring this to completion. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Church, we love you. We can't wait to see you next week.